What's up everybody? John here. Hey, do you want to buy some vintage gear? Well, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five tips to help you on your way to vintage gear Valhalla. But first, let's hear what some of my gear sounds like. Besides the guitar, this signal chain is all from the 60s and 70s. I hope you enjoy. So welcome back everybody. This video on how to buy vintage gear is mainly geared towards online sales due to the scarcity of a lot of vintage stuff on the local market, but the same rules apply if you find something great at your local music store. So let's get into the tips. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna say is you gotta do your homework out there. Is that a Fender Blackface amp? Is that a CE2 with a silver screw? Is that an Echoplex EP3 with a black tape panel? Is that a Fender Silverface with a drip edge? Is that a vintage boss pedal with a long dash? These are just some of the categories and lore you'll find out about when researching gear. So it's important to research the manufacturing history of gear you're lusting over. Oh my god, I gotta have this amp. Many products undergo design and manufacturing changes that affects the price and the tone. A basic example is take a Fender amp from 1967 and a Fender amp from 1977 and one costs a lot of money and the other one is probably holding up someone's coffee table. Also it's important to research the market and see what's going on with the condition versus the price so you don't overpay. So if you're tone hunting for your favorite player's tone, it's important to find out not only what amp or pedal you like that they use, but also what year and what circuit, what version they're using. Because like I said, a lot of these products undergo design and manufacturing changes. When you're researching gear you want, it's important to see what kind of flaws there are for all of these versions. Here are some examples. So I have a couple Power Series Ibanez pedals up here. And one of the problems with them, a potential problem, is the input and output jacks are a little cheap and the problem is, is they're soldered directly to the circuit board, which if they break, they're really hard to fix. Also, the foot switches are notoriously fickle, so when I bought these guys on Reverb, I was sure to ask the seller about them. Also, vintage Echoplex motors, they're approaching 40, 50 years old, so that's something to ask about too. Also, with my spring reverb tank, the springs that hold the tank in place, they're notoriously easy to snap or stretch, and it's hard to find replacements with the adequate tension. So these are just some examples of some flaws and things to look out for, but it's up to you to do your homework to make sure you know what you're buying. 1965 Fender Deluxe Reverb Amp. 1966 Fender Reverb Tank. Late 80s, Ibanez Twin Cam Chorus. This one's a sleeper, guys. Mid 80s, Ibanez CP9. 1987, Boss Dimension C. 1976, MXR Flanger. Late 80s, Ibanez Swell Flanger. Okay, number two, you gotta buy as original and as clean as possible. So I'm not collecting this vintage gear as an investment. However, I know in 20 years, it's gonna be worth a lot more. Ha ha ha, my retirement plan. So generally for effect pedals, we're only concerned about the circuit and stuff like that. Not too much of the cosmetic stuff, but vintage amps, even replacement cosmetic items can ding the price. 
So of course for amps, things like replacement power transformers, speakers, reverb tanks, etc. drastically affect the price, but even cosmetic items like knobs, grill cloths, even back panels are a big no-no. So when I bought my 68 Super Reverb down here, I really got screwed, and I'll tell you why. This was the first vintage item I ever bought, and I just wanted a vintage Fender amp. And there was a music store in the Valley, I'm not going to give them a shout out because they screwed me here, um, that I just went in there, they had a bunch of these amps, and this particular one, hey, I love this amp, don't get me wrong, but it has a replacement grill, a few other small replacement items, and replacement speakers. <laughs> Boy, this guy's an idiot. So like my first tip, I wish I would have done my homework because the only thing I knew about this amp is that I wanted it. And look what happened. I really got screwed. So as a rule of thumb, everything should be as clean as possible. Of course, on an amp, replacement items like tubes, capacitors, and resistors, these items do go out of tolerance over time. And these are considered acceptable repairs unless you're trying to maintain a museum piece. Also on this list, I would add a replacement three-prong plug to replace the two-prong plug from the 60s and 70s, because you don't want to get electrocuted. Hey, wow, the same sounds great. <laughs> okay, so the third tip I'm going to give you is be prepared to wait. We've got to be patient out there, you guys. So I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm not too proud about it, but some of these things that I bought, they were impulse buys. What can I say? I'm on the couch having a couple drinks, and before you know it, I'm pressing buttons and spending money. However, sometimes when I've done that, I found a little bit better of a unit a couple weeks down the line. Nothing drastic, but maybe I could have saved a little money. Maybe I could have found one in a little bit better condition. Heed my warning, guys. A lot of these vintage items are scarce. They're hard to come by. Maybe people are just holding on to them. So that's why it's important to be patient and see what comes up on the market, either locally or online. We should be grateful that we're all living in this age of the internet, or else we'd be calling all of our local music stores every couple days asking them, hey, is a 1966 reverb unit in there yet? That would suck. So in my hunt for my deluxe reverb amp, there was one that was pretty clean at a decent price and I almost bought it. I don't know what happened, someone must have snatched it out from under me, but then lo and behold, a couple weeks later, I got this one off Reverb and it's the cleanest one me or my tech has ever seen. Also my Boss CE1 chorus pedal, I was waiting for months and months, maybe four or five months, scouring Reverb, scouring eBay. I just couldn't find one that was clean. People are just throwing these things around or making some stupid mods. I don't know what's going on with them. but I I finally got my Boss CE1 and it's so clean, it still has the plastic on the front. The last two tips I'm going to give you fall under this category of you got to find a good technician. you got to find someone who's been around the block with these vintage pieces. There's so much more that goes into troubleshooting and repairing these units than just looking at a schematic and testing component values. These older pieces almost have a personality to their own and it's important to find someone who's been fixing older vintage things for a while. So my fourth tip is prepare to fix something and at the very least get it checked out by a tech when you receive it in the mail or pick it up from the store. So for vintage stuff like an amp, spring reverb, echoplex, etc., some sort of complex circuit, prepare to fork over some money when you first get it for some sort of maintenance, even if the seller swears it's 100% ready to go. Yeah, I know the speakers are blown, uh, but that smoke is 100% normal. All sorts of components like tubes, resistors, capacitors, they all go out of tolerance over time, they all go bad over time, and the older your unit is, the more likely you're going to need to replace these things. And your tech can be a great service to tell you what 100% needs to be replaced and what can be held off on a little bit. Me, personally, with these vintage items, one of the things that people uh, knock these vintage pieces are is the reliability. So I always want to make sure that it's as, as reliable as it can be, everything is 100% up to spec, so I always tell my tech to go through the things with a fine tooth comb. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of things that needed to be fixed with some of the gear that I got. So my deluxe reverb up here, uh, it's, it's in very, very good condition. However, when it first came in the mail, there was a couple things that were a little bit out of spec and they would have gone sooner or later. So I just had those replaced. No big deal. On my shallower fuzz that I use on the intro, some of the soldering points needed a touch up. On my spring reverb tank, something happened in the mail and it got a little bit messed up. The reverb tank was a little out of alignment. Thank God my tech knew how to fix it and it's a killer unit. A lot of the pedals that I have needed a potentiometer flush 
for dust and other debris in there over the years. I mean, they're coming up on 40 years old. My Echoplex EP3, it did work. However, a lot of the components were out of spec a little bit and just needed a tune-up. So this vintage gear, it's been used a lot. It's been around the block or maybe it's been in storage for a little while. Either way, there's gonna be some items that need to be fixed, need to be repaired. It's just part of the deal. A lot of people have different definitions of what 100% ready to go means. Mine is, is having it be a unit be as reliable as possible, so I always want everything up to spec. And if it's an important component, I'll just save it for the next buyer if I decide to sell it. Circa early 70s, Echoplex EP3. 1968 Fender Super Reverb Amp. 1970s Mutron 3. 1982 Boss CE1. Oh, I love you. 1981 Boss CE2. 1982 Ibanez CS9. 2005 Maxon CP101. That's not vintage. Haha, <laughs> yeah, I know. So my fifth tip is to have your tech help you when you're looking at an ad online or make sure you can get a hold of them and send them pictures of something you're looking at in person. This is so important. Anytime I'm looking at a big ticket item, more than a couple hundred bucks, or if it's something I'm just not familiar with at all, I'm always on the phone with my tech asking him what he thinks. It's important to have someone knowledgeable look at these amps and complex circuits for signs of previous repairs, modifications, botched repairs, and other kind of issues we're just not going to know about. Think about it. You would never buy a house or an old car without having some kind of pro look at it. I don't know, honey. That doesn't look like termites to me. So depending on what your tech sees with the pictures and info on the ad, they can help you avoid buying a bad unit. Or they could save you money if they see an issue that's an easy repair. Or they could suggest a unit that you might not have even thought of. So here's a story about how I got my CE1. Like I said, I was searching and searching. I could never find a clean one that I thought was good enough. And one day I was on the phone with my tech talking about it. We were on Reverb and he came across a non-export Boss CE1. So this means it was meant to stay in Japan and accept the 100 volts out of the wall that the Japanese units are supposed to do. Here in the U.S. it's 120, and if I would have bought that unit, I would have had to have either a power transformer or some gobbledygook I don't want to mess with. Well, he did some research, and that particular version of the non-export model, it had the same power transformer as the North American versions, and he said it was a pretty easy modification to get it to accept 120 volts off the wall. And that's what I have now. I would have never thought about buying a Japanese CE1 because I would have thought it just never would have worked. So there's an example of where my tech really helped me out. So my deluxe reverb up here, my hunt for this guy, probably went through about six or more reverb and eBay listings before we found this one. And you know, it was amazing having my tech go through all the pictures and he'd just be finding things left and right that I never would have thought of, like evidence of past rust that someone kind of buffed away and silverfish eating the paper label inside the amp chassis. That means it was stored in a, in a damp basement or a garage. No, 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 no. He also saw evidence on a bunch of them of previous modifications that had been put back in order, sloppy repairs, sloppy soldering jobs, etc. Having your tech go through some of these pictures and you listening to what he or she says can really give you an insight on a lot of these units and help you know more about what you're trying to buy. So I hope you guys out there enjoyed this video. I hope you guys learned something about buying vintage gear. If you did learn something, hit me up on the comments below. Let me know what you learned. You know, this vintage gear, it's not for everybody, but me personally, I really like it. And going along with tips four and five, you've got to have someone to help you fix it because you just can't take this stuff to your local guitar center and expect those idiots to get it up and running for you. Well, until the next time, I'm John, and we'll see you down that dusty trail.